continuing in this matter of the Lord's second coming. He shall come the second time. Praise God. What a, what a blessing. It was a blessing when he came the first time. <laughs> you can imagine what it's going to be the second time. <clears throat> Tonight I want to eat when Jesus comes again. The great wrap up. <clears throat> Now, it's important to understand the, the reason for redemption and what God's doing in redemption. Now, sometimes this gets obscured by the approaches people take to salvation or uh, preaching the gospel. They somehow manage to obscure what God's doing. It all kind of ends up to be an effort of man. And mm -hmm. They speak as though it's just a totally man, but it's just not totally man at all. The world, from one uh, viewpoint, is a, like a stage on which the drama of redemption is being worked out. And the angelic hosts are the spectators in this great work. <coughs> it just tell us this precisely, of course, in Ephesians 3.10, that now under principalities and powers, his manifold wisdom is being made known by the church. So he's, he's showing his great wisdom. He's gathering everything together in Christ. That's the ultimate. He states, he tells us what the ultimate objective is. Several different places, but here's, here's, here's some of them. Ephesians 1, 9, and 10. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things, in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. That's, that's the aim. Everything that's, un, everything that's reconciled to God through Christ, or everything that is related immediately to Christ, be it angel or man, the objective is to have them all together at one place and one time. That's going to happen. That's his aim. So you make it your aim to be one of these. <laughs> Again, as I mentioned in Ephesians 3, 9, and 10, is to demonstrate his manifold wisdom, to show it, exhibit the diversity of his wisdom. How he can accomplish something like this in this kind of arena is, is remarkable. It takes God to do something like that. And he even mentions the scope of his uh, redemption and his purpose. He sort of spells it out. He said, as, as many as he foreknew, he predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son. And those he predestinated, he called. Whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified, he glorified. So he's, he lays out on the trestle board what he's, what he's going to do. So if you're in Christ, I can tell it's going to end up glory. That's, what, that's how it's going to end up. You'll recall it in the Garden of, uh, of Eden. God divulged to Satan, and, and the whole human race was listening, that he was going to bruise, the seed of the woman would bruise Satan's head. Now you've got to see from the perspective of how God is going to do this, through the seed to bruise the serpent's head. Uh, deity had no difficulty subduing Satan. Let's just make this clear. When God pit Satan out, he, he couldn't get back in. When he fell... He couldn't get back in. God has no trouble subduing Satan. So we talk about he was going to bruise the head of the serpent. We're not saying like this is a difficult task no. for God to do. It's how he's going to do this. He was going to take people that Satan had overcome and deliver them from his dominion. That's how he was going to do it. And Jesus neutralized Satan at the cross by removing sin, which was Satan's power. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how he got people. And he took it away. Now, what I'm going to show tonight is that once the church is complete, there's really no further need for the world as it now is. That's the only reason it's remaining. That is the only reason it's remaining. Otherwise, he'd have just liquidated at the flood and it never would have resurfaced. He just had obliterated humanity in the garden and never would have happened again. See, but he had a purpose. And it's a large purpose. This is not a small purpose. This is a large purpose. Church complete when Jesus comes again. We know that uh, the scriptures tell us that God visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. 
And once they're out for his name, and once all the people that he determined, remember who he foreknew, they'd be predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son. Once all the people he foreknew are out, <laughs> there's, there's really no reason to continue, continue history as it is. And the scriptures are going to tell us that this is going to occur, the completion that will be revealed when Jesus comes again. Now my overall text is 1 Corinthians 15.23 which is speaking of the resurrection or the defeat of the final enemy. There aren't any enemies after death. There are no enemies for the child of God after death. It's the last enemy. Now here's what the scripture says. Every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. That's it. Now the, what he's talking about, every man in his own order, is that recovery from the dead. From the, the dead, earth's going to cast out her dead. When is it going to do it? When Jesus comes again. That this is possible is confirmed by Christ himself raising from the dead and taking his life back. So there's no question about the possibility of this. That there'll be no question about this. That when Jesus comes simultaneously at one time, all the body of Christ is going to be gathered to him. It will be, have been completed. Now Jesus is going to present the entire church to himself. What a, it's quite a picture to contemplate. He give, gives a little, little glimpse of it in Ephesians 5.27. He says that the purpose of Christ is to present to himself a glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish. So now that's what, what Jesus is doing now is he's cleaning us up. That's what he's doing. So when he presents the people, his wife or bride to himself, there will not be anything distracting about her. <laughs> there will have to be nothing forgiven in her. There will not be anything that's uncomely about her. That's his aim. We've talked some recently here about the people of God and the purity that's necessary in God's people. And like this is not a matter of opinion. He says, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and don't you touch the unclean thing. Why not? Just because it's a matter of law? No. Because Jesus is presenting to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. Mm -hmm. And he's allowed us to enter into the cleansing process. Not by taking away sin ourselves but by keeping clean and availing ourselves of the atonement. So that's his ultimate objective. Present it. He's not going to present it in stages. He's going to present it at once to himself. Now in this world, we each leave and absent from the body and present with the Lord one by one. It, it takes place. But there's an ultimate gathering that's not going to be one by one. It's going to be all together at one time presented to the Lord. Again, the scripture says in Colossians 1.28, we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. Not one by one, all at one time, complete. The point I'm building here is that the church is a perspective of the body of Christ being complete. One whole entity. 2 Corinthians 11.2, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So do you wonder why Paul wrote about cleanliness and moral purity and being clean before the Lord? He knew what God's objective was. is to present a clean body all at one time. And so he works. This is the cleansing time right now. In a, this juncture called time. This is when the cleansing is taking place. And so he... Paul was very concerned about that. 1 Thessalonians 3.13 To the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness even before God, even our Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's his aim. When Jesus comes, clean. That's the aim. And salvation is adapted to do this. This is what salvation does. The gospel is a message that contributes to this. Spiritual gifts are things that aid this whole process. This whole thing is designed that's spotless when Jesus comes again. In its entirety, not, not just you, the whole body. Jesus didn't save you just for you. 
He loved you and gave himself for you. But I'll tell you right now, if Isaiah said Israel was too small, it was a light thing just to take Israel, that wasn't, that wasn't big enough for a dying Savior. Amen. It wasn't a big enough thing for just a nation of Israel to be saved, let alone one of us. I've heard people say, if you were the only one in the world, Jesus would have died. It's a lot of hokum. This is not true. Jesus died for more than Israel, and that's a lot of people. He, he had a large purpose, a whole church to be presented to him without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. 2 Thessalonians 1.10 When he shall come to be glorified in his saints, to be admired in all them that believe. See, that's, what, that's his aim. When Jesus comes back, and Jude 1 24 says to be presented spotless or faultless before his presence with uh, exceeding joy. Now the gathering is going to take place when Jesus comes. That's the grand gathering. We sing a song, we sing a song, what a gathering, what a gathering that will be. That's, that's the time of gathering. When he comes again, <coughs> when all of them will be gathered. Now the scriptures speak this. Even John the Baptist, he, he gave a hint of this. Even in his preliminary ministry, making preparing people. He was to prepare the way of the Lord. Get people ready for Jesus. So here's one way he got them ready. He told them that his about the Savior, his fans in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garden. See, he, he knew that. That was what that's what he was going to do. This is why you want to repent. This is why you want to keep yourself clean. You want to be one of those gathered in to the everlasting garner or barn. Uh, there's a place for the wheat. It's not intended to stay in the field. Anybody knows this, huh? Any agricultural person knows the aim of the wheat is not to stay in the field. At some point it's got to get out of the field and into the barn and that's going to happen when Jesus comes again. Again, hear Jesus speak, Matthew 13, uh, Mark, Matthew 13, 30. The parable of the wheat and the tares. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together the tares first, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat, not some wheat. Gather the wheat into my barn. He goes on to say, Therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, that shall be willing the gnashing of teeth, and then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Well, all the bad stuff's coming out one of these days. When it does, what's going to be left is just gathering. <laughs> Of the people, the flock of God unto himself. Amen. Matthew 24, 30. I'm showing this gathering is going to take place at his coming. That's what we're establishing here. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn when they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sign of a trumpet. They shall gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. <laughs> yeah, that's the gathering, see. That's what we're talking about, the church complete. Mark said this, Then shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He shall send his angels, and they shall gather his elect from the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. And there isn't any place else. That's like, that's it. <laughs> They're all going to be gathered. And it's, and it's coming now. That's the point I'm making. The church is going to be complete. It is coming. You may think this is very, rather elementary, but now there, there are a lot of doctrines that teach there's going to be an enormous amount of activity on the earth and another gospel preached and all this kind of stuff is being preached. And not just to a little bit of cluster of people. The whole Left Behind series is about this. This book series, this whole thing is about this. The people left behind. That's the whole series about this. And there's even another gospel that's preached. Some of them are salvaged without the church and without the Holy Spirit, which is a bit of an absurdity for someone who knows Christ. Well, you can't take the light of the world out of the world and the world will still have light. <laughs> can't happen. <clears throat> now, is that, now the church completed at Christ's coming. I showed here that it is at his coming. 
The saints are going to be gathered from the uttermost part of earth to the uttermost part of heaven. That's they're all going to be gathered together. Now let's look at some other scriptural allusions to this. And there's several factors I want to look at here, about four. The first I want to look at the together factor. <clears throat> together. The church is going to be together, gathered to Christ. As I mentioned, now we leave one by one. By one. We're added to the body of Christ, you know, one by one, or a small group at a time. But that's not the way we're going to be gathered to Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 tells us, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The idea is that a great mass of the body of Christ has died, it has gone on, and their bodies are in the graves. When Jesus comes, the grave is going to empty out. And then those that are alive and remain will be changed. And together we'll be gathered to meet the Lord in the air. See, the church complete. Again, Romans the 8th chapter and verse 17. If children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ, it shall be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. You just remember, we're talking about the together factor here. So all going to be together. So here in this world, sometimes you're like isolated from the other brothers and sisters. There's some people in this world that are really isolated from their brothers and sisters. They're just like John and the Isle of Patmos. But there's a time when isolation is going to end. Amen. It's going to end. And we're going to see Abraham and Isaac and all the prophets in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. They'll all be together in one place. At one time we saw, you saw three notables of the kingdom. The head of the kingdom, Jesus, and Moses, and Elijah. There was three of them, which was quite a Quite an assembly, just that three. <laughs> well, there's a bigger assembly than this schedule, let me tell you. And it's going to get more very impressive assembly when we're all gathered together with him. 2 Thessalonians 2.1 I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering unto him. Who's our? It's not just Paul and the Thessalonians. Or the Corinthians. For us. It's the whole body. The together factor. Scripture is teaching us. See, there's a there's on the horizon of eternal purpose, there's a point time appointed when all the body of Christ at one time is going to be all assembled and gathered together under their Savior. So shall they ever be with the Lord. He told us in the parables that this time involved the extraction of the tares, removal of the wicked, and all things that offend. Now let's look at the all factor. There's a time we're all going to be there. If you're living at a distance from the Lord, this is a scary thing to consider. If you're close to God, this is a grand thing to consider. Romans 14, 10 through 12. Why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It is written, as I live, saith the Lord, that every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Well, it's not going to be like, you have your day and I'll have my day. It's just going to be at one time. God's going to judge the world once. Not five or ten or fifteen times, or two different times, the righteous and the ungodly. It's all going to be at once. There's a day of judgment. Very specific about it. And that's going to be a glorious day for us, see, those who are in Christ Jesus. Again, the all factor. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. As in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. That's the resurrection. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, 51. There's some that are going to be, the resurrection is going to involve people in the grave and people that are alive. Go so ahead. All shall be raised. That's those in the grave. Here, 51, chapter 1 Corinthians 15, 51, those that are alive. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Because everybody's not going to die. There's going to be a whole generation that won't die. But we shall all be changed. When are we all going to be changed? 
It's all going to happen at one time. When the body's complete, it's not going to be multiple resurrections. It's going to be one changing. And here, people that teach that after Jesus comes again, that there's still going to be people in the flesh, in this world, you've got to come up with another resurrection now. You've got to come up with another change. No, you have to do this now. If you believe that after Jesus comes the second time in glory, that there's still people after Jesus comes in the flesh, after the resurrection of the dead, and after the bruising of the hand of the serpent, then you've got to come up with another change. And there just isn't anything like that declared in the Bible. It's going to happen one time. There's going to be one final change. Heavens and earth are going to be involved. And the sons of God are going to be involved. And all the wicked are going to be involved. One more change. And when it happens, the body of Christ shall have been complete. And everybody will have been gathered in that God foreknew. But known unto the Lord are all his works from the foundation of the world. Make no mistake about it. And the Lord knows them that are his. We may not, but he, he does. They'll all be in. The all factor. 1 Thessalonians 3.13 To the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all of his saints. There it is. So from the standpoint of those that have passed on, he'll bring their spirits back with him. Those that haven't, they'll be caught up <laughs> to meet the Lord in the air. But it's all, all the saints. He's not going to come back with half the saints or representatives of the saints. All of them are going to be with him. The all factor. 2 Thessalonians 1.10 When he shall come to be glorified in his saints to be admired in all them that believe. See? So not just some. All. So there's this all factor. And there's the our, our factor. Speaking for the whole body of Christ. Philippians 3.20 our conversation or manner of life is in heaven from whence we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, singular, our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he's able to even to subdue all things to himself. Now, everybody's going to get a body at the same time. It's not going to be different times. You're not going to get an immortal body, and then some time pass, and some more God's people get immortal bodies. They're all going to get it at one time. Just as surely as there was one resurrection of the Savior, there's going to be one resurrection of the saints. And it's not going to happen till the body's complete. Now, when it is, death's going to be dealt the final blow. It's going to be, that's going to be it. And there'll be no more, no more death for the people of God at all. And then there's the every man factor. See, I'm showing here that when Jesus comes now, the body of Christ is complete. And that's why he uses these words like every and all and together. Here's 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Judge nothing before the time. What time is that? Till the Lord come. Who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and make manifest the counsels of the heart and then shall every man Receive praise from God. Jesus is going to be complete at that time. Every man. Matthew 16, 27. Let's have Jesus testify about this. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall he reward every man according to his works. You have join here that it's complete. The body of Christ is complete when Jesus comes again. Revelation 22, 12. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is it with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Well, I can only imagine how anxious the Lord is for this. As he's waiting, so to speak, with a sickle in his hand, waiting to reap the, to reap the earth when the harvest is complete. <laughs> when do you do the reaping? Do you do the reaping piecemeal? <laughs> You don't do that. When the harvest of the earth is ripe, it's going to all be reaped at once. And there's two harvests that are coming out of the earth. One is the harvest field of God, and the other is the vine of the earth. 
Revelation refers to. It's the wicked. There's going to come a time when the wicked, when their, when their harvest is done too. God knows when the timetable is. I don't know, but there's coming a time when the last person's going to come in the body and the last person's going to be iniquitous. That's going to be it. He's going to call into it the time and gather in the saints and thrust out the wicked. See, you couldn't thrust out the wicked piecemeal. That's, Israel had to do that when they went into Canaan. They had to piecemeal throw them out. And we're kind of piecemealing it now, but when Jesus does it, it's not going to be piecemeal. He could do it all at once. Rid of the wicked, gather in the saints, all at one time. Now let's look at some various teachings of Scripture of the, of the righteous together, the elect together, this together view. Here by faith we're together, but there we're, it's going to be reality. It's going to actually happen in all of its fullness. <clears throat> You will think that you can think back in Scripture. Noah's family was all saved together. They didn't have to build five different boats five different times. They, they were all saved together one time. When Israel came out of Egypt, they all came out together. It wasn't one, wasn't one at a time. It was all together. When Israel went into Canaan, we all went in together. It wasn't one at a time. So there's this together, together factor. Jesus, he prayed the night of his betrayal, John 17, verse 24. He said, Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. Well, who's that? It's all the ones given him. That they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation <coughs> of the world. So that's, he projects his mind, this is what I want, Lord, I want. I want everybody you've given me to see my glory. Well, they're not going to, it's not going to be private showings. It really is. He's going to reveal his son at one time. He's going to show him that he's the only one and only potentate who's overall. For us, <laughs> it'll be a grand day of redemption. We'll see his glory like nobody else sees it. All together at the same time. Again, 1 John 3 in verse 2, he says virtually virtually the same thing. that he, he said, All the saints of God are going to experience this at the same time. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So, so of course, you wouldn't want to take a position that says some of God's people will be like him, and maybe at some other time some of the others will be like him. They're all going to be at one time like him. Again, Romans 8, 17 speaks of us being glorified together. That's, that's church complete. You couldn't say that if the church wasn't complete. If the body of Christ wasn't all gathered in, you couldn't say glorified together. That kind of language wouldn't fit that kind of scenario. You'd have to say some were glorified or some were taken or some were gathered to their people. But oh, this is going to be everybody, all of them, all the saints. Again, Ephesians 1.10, he's going to gather all things in one in Christ. Or 2 Thessalonians 2.1, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our, ga our gathering together unto him. See, so there's no question about, about this. It's all going to be at his coming. We'll be caught up together to be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 tells us. Now, for this reason, the apostles would frequently, they wrote, particularly Paul, they'd zero in on Christ's coming. They'd, they'd project you to Christ's coming. You, every time they did, you got the distinct impression it was all over them. It, it's just, it, the way it's said just leaves you with this. Let me give you some examples of this. 1 Corinthians 1 9. So that you come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's like he pinpoints an event to all the people of God, the coming. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, 23. Every man in his own order, Christ that froze first fruits, afterward they that are to Christ at his coming. Focus you on that time. Now, what I'm saying is, this kind of language would not be proper if all the body wasn't in at that time. What do you say to the rest of the people? After you say, be anticlimactic. They're all in at this time. 
Again, 1 Thessalonians 2.19. What is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not ye, even ye, in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? So he points to that. Again, 1 Thessalonians 3.13. To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, they, they, they throw my soul to <laughs> to think about this. He gives you a point in time you can focus on and it's the end of trouble, it's the end of weakness, it's the end of ba inward battle, it's the end of enemies, it's the end, it's the end of up and downs, it's the end of everything that's against you and the beginning of everything is eternal and it will never subside. Not one time. 1 Thessalonians 4.15 This we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming. <laughs> of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's that's the focus point, the coming. Couldn't say this if the body of Christ was not complete at that time. Then you'd have to have another gospel to give them, and some people do, believe it or not. They do. <laughs> they do say there's another gospel going to be preached. I, I don't know who the center of that gospel would be, but I, I don't want anything to do with another gospel. I don't want anything to do with another gospel. Amen. Paul said, which is not another. There really isn't any other gospel, in other words. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 2.1 We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. James 5, 7 and 8. Be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming. See? Pointing you to this. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. Be also patient. Establish your heart for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. So he's, it's a perfect consistency of this throughout Scripture. We might not be ashamed before him at his coming, John says in 1 John 2.28. So this is, the, uh, this is where we've cast our eyes. This is our hope. It's called the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. There's going to be no further salvation on this earth after that. That's going to be the grand wrap up when God told you it's going to get wrapped up. There's an appointed time when everything's going to be gathered together. There's an appointed time. He's told you it's the coming of the Lord. That's the appointed time when it's all going to happen. And the body will be complete. What a glorious day it will be. Such a focus is not possible, of course, if the church is not complete at that time. Now let's take a, make a few concluding thoughts here. <clears throat> There's a certain rationale behind all of these statements. It is that now, this is the day of salvation. Up until that time, the Lord's coming, that's the time when salvation, the door of salvation is open. This is the day of salvation. It's what the scriptures call the accepted time. That's the, this is the time when you can be received by God. This is a time when you can be made clean. This is a time when you can be made acceptable. This is a time when you can be perfected. This is the time. And if you avail yourself of that, then when, then when the time comes, the appearing of the Lord, you'll be gathered unto Him. This is the today of Scripture. Today. Today, if you will hear His voice. Today. Now, everyone's going to hear his voice when he returns with a shout. But the door of salvation is not going to be open at that time. It's going to be closed. Just like that parable that five foolish virgins, the door was shut. So they all oh, be people here. There'll be people here. But if you hear now, today, then you're ready when he comes the second time. Hebrews 3.13, exhort one another daily while it is called today. See, today. Now, what I'm saying is that this kind of language presumes that there's a point in time when the today is done <laughs> and the door is closed and the body is complete. Otherwise, this kind of language doesn't mean anything. 
So this is the time here of the ingathering when we, uh, when we can come to the Lord. Again, Hebrews 4, 7. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying, Today. That is, this, this offer of salvation is going to terminate. It is going to terminate. The striving of the Spirit with people is going to terminate. The time when the Holy Spirit convinces people of sin, righteousness, and judgment. This is going to terminate. This is not an eternal situation. The time when the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. That, that's going to terminate. It's going to come down and it's terminated. It's going to terminate when there's no further need for it. When the body is complete, that's it. So while the door is open, get in. Amen. That's it. Whatever stands between you and Christ... Today's, not tomorrow, today is the time to get, get rid of those obstacles. Amen. And I encourage you to do so, young or old, to enter into it zealously. Unfortunately, we live in a period of time when there's an entire generation is being lost to theological novelty. Being lost. And people, young souls, aren't being taught to have a quest, a burning quest for God and for His great salvation. They sort of are being led to believe this is kind of for the adults, maybe, but there's something, kind of a subdued version that's for the rest of us. <clears throat> this is the day of salvation today. So what if you have to, like, get your house in order, think of it this way. I got today to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's it. You don't like have a lifetime. Your lifetime may terminate tonight. Matter of fact, some years ago, in um, Carl Junction, where Brother Boyce preaches, Brother George was there, a man died in the church service. There in the meeting. He died. I want to see. <laughs> I, that wasn't like people didn't know the schedule today. I suppose if you're going to die, that's about as good a place to die as you can find, right? <laughs> Among God's people. The time. This is the acceptable year. Jesus stood up when he revealed a manifesto of what he came to do. He told what his mission was. He says, I have come to announce liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those that are bound and so forth. He says, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. What he was saying was, the door is open now. Whosoever will may come. But when the last one's in, the door will be shut. That is at his coming. This is called the time, 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Now the only reason for the world remaining, if you can see it, is for it's a, it's a time in which the body of Christ is being developed. The Lord is adding daily to the church such as should be saved. Just like he did in Acts 2 47. So that is going on now. The Lord is adding to the church daily such as should be saved. And the church itself it's got its work it's doing. It's making herself ready. Revelation 19 7 says that the day of the marriage supper of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. Ready for what? For this climactic moment. When the body of Christ is complete, the offer of salvation is removed from the table, the intercessor leaves the throne room, it's over, there isn't going to be any more. The Holy Spirit ceases to strive with people. The door of salvation is shut. Now the aim is, get in before that happens. Amen. And if you are, there's not an angelic host or a, a militia from hell that could keep you out. I thank the Lord for that.